the Lord had laid some stuff on my heart, and so no fault to Kathy because she put in the bulletin what I was supposed to preach. But the Lord has led me in a different direction. Take your Bibles and turn to Habakkuk. Y'all are saying, why in the world Habakkuk? Sticky pages. Yes. It's okay, I'll wait till you find Habakkuk. It'll take a little bit. I don't want you to panic because we're going to cover the entire book of Habakkuk. I'm supposed to be speaking at a certain time there. They've asked me to be there at 1 o'clock. I said that's not happening. But I also want to let you know the other thing is that after the service, I usually stand at the back to say hello to each of you. I will actually be standing outside this door outside. Um, so I'd love to say hi to each of you, but just so you're aware. We obviously are not going to read the entirety of Habakkuk. I'm not going to cover every verse in the book of Habakkuk. We're going to try to do an overview of Habakkuk, which is going to be hard. But with what's going on in our world, I feel it's important. Does anybody know anything about Habakkuk? I'm just curious. Just raise your hand real quick. Yes? No? Okay. Two of you. Good. <laughs> the easiest question is who wrote Habakkuk? Habakkuk. <laughs> yes. We could argue, is it Habakkuk or Habakkuk? I don't mind either way. But the author is Habakkuk. You know, it's certain that Habakkuk was the contemporary of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Zephaniah. <coughs> Habakkuk was prophesying during the final days of the Assyrian Empire in the beginning of the Babylonians' world rulership under Nabopolassar and his son Nebuchadnezzar. Difficult times. Take your Bibles and jump over to 2 Chronicles 35. Keep your hand in Habakkuk so we don't get lost. I think it's really important that we understand what is going on when we come to the book of Habakkuk. I did something different so that I would not go too fast. I actually didn't write these verses in my Bible, so I turned there as well, so that I give you a little more time. Let me know if this is a good thing. If it is, I'll keep doing this, maybe. <laughs> Second Chronicles 35, beginning in verse 20, listen to what it says. After all this, when Josiah had set the temple in order, Necho, king of Egypt, came up to make war against Carchemish on the Euphrates, and Josiah went out to engage him. But Necho sent messengers to him, saying, What have we to do with each other, O king of Judah? I am not coming against you today, but against the house with which I am at war. And God has ordered me to hurry. Stop for your own sake from interfering with God who is with me, so that he will not destroy you. Verse 22, however, Josiah would not turn away from him, but disguise himself in order to make war with him. Nor did he listen to the words of Necho from the mouth of God, but came to make war on the plain of Megiddo. The archer shot King Josiah, and the king said to his servants, Take me away, for I am badly wounded. So his servants took him out of the chariot and carried him into the second chariot, which he had, and brought him to Jerusalem, where he died and was buried in the tombs of his father. All Jude and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. Josiah was killed in this battle, leaving his throne to a succession of three sons and a grandson. Josiah had instituted significant spiritual reforms, right? Yes. 
Josiah was a, was a man that loved God and wanted the nation to follow God. Josiah abolished many of the idolatrous practices of his father, Ammon. His grandfather was Manasseh. Those men were men that did what was wicked and evil in the eyes of God. During this time, we have Habakkuk. The book of Habakkuk was written approximately about 610 BC. It was written to Judah. And the theme of Habakkuk, I would say, is faith and doubt. Habakkuk begins to question God's silence and apparent lack of action to purge his covenant people. Why, God? Why? Anybody asking why, America? Why? I submit to you the book of Habakkuk is extraordinarily applicable to each one of us. And I will draw more application at the end of this morning's message probably than I ever have. I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed that God protect our church. Because we have churches around us that are being divided because of what America is doing. Because what they are saying that we need to do, and we Americans rise up and say, yes, I agree, no, I don't agree, I have freedom. If you love God, then live for God. be a long morning. The best way to break down the book of Habakkuk, I believe chapters 1 and 2, we deal with the problem of Habakkuk. Habakkuk goes, why God, why? And then you have chapter 3, Habakkuk goes on his face, okay God, okay God. As we do a survey of the book of Habakkuk this morning, Lord willing, we will see three things. First, I want us to see Habakkuk questions God. Secondly, how God responds. And thirdly, I want us to look at how, uh, how Habakkuk responds to God's answer. I want each one of us, myself included, to think about this question. How are you responding when you are tempted to question what God is doing? How are you responding when you are tempted to question what our God is doing? Habakkuk chapter 1, we'll look at the first four verses quickly. He says in Habakkuk 1, he says, The oracle which Habakkuk the prophet saw, How long, O Lord, will I call for help, and you will not hear? I cry out to you violence, yet you do not save. Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore, the law is ignored and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. Habakkuk begins in these verses. He is questioning God. God, where are you? God, I, I'm calling for help. You're not answering me. Habakkuk says, I yell violence. And God, you don't save me. Habakkuk says, God, why do you allow me to see iniquity and look on the wickedness and destruction and the violence that are happening the strife and the contention, the law is ignored, justice is forsaken, wickednesses are surrounding the righteous, justice is being perverted, and this is what Habakkuk does. Let me ask how many of us maybe are saying, why America? Why governor? Why president? Why, why, why? Our answer is the same that God gives to Habakkuk. 
The question is, what is your life and my life going to demonstrate? Anybody frustrated? Okay, three of you. Good. <laughs> Don't lie to me. <laughs> Guys, it's hard. It's really hard. Doing water wars out there, I had to carry around a face mask. Oh, well. Carry around the face mask, wear it when I need to wear it, and proclaim the gospel and see these little kids have fun with water balloons. The word of God is not in prison. It will never be in prison. Don't let this stuff mess up your actions and your lifestyle. Habakkuk cries out and he questions God. Make it personal. What about us? Are we questioning God? God, where are you? God, why? God, I don't understand. I think you are overstepping your bounds on my freedom as an American. I think you're doing this. We can go all over the place. But that should never be a reason to allow contention and division arise within the church. That should never be a reason to allow us to be short and bitter with one another. Amen. Never. What's happening in America? We're saying, why God? But God knows. When I talked about it, I don't know, four weeks ago, when how do we respond in a world that is falling apart? God's in the process of refining us, revealing to us the sinful attitudes and maybe what we think and, and, and maybe the sin is coming to the surface and God says, scrape it off, get rid of it. That's how we all got to respond. You think I'm happy? You think I'm overwhelmed? You think I'm scared? You think I'm intimidated? Yeah. But God's called me to a position of leadership and I'm doing the best I can to be faithful to God. And I want each of you to do the same thing. But what does God say to Habakkuk? Habakkuk says, God, when are you going to deal with the sin of the, uh, of the nation Judah? God answers Habakkuk. This is classic, verse 5. He says, look among the nations, observe, be astounded, wonder, because I'm doing something in your days. You would not believe if you were told. Could you imagine Habakkuk? Yeah, you are, God. <laughs> Check it out. Verse 6. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, the fierce and impetuous people who marched throughout the earth to seize dwelling places without, uh, which are not theirs. They are dreaded and feared. Their justice and authority originate with themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and keener than wolves in the evening. Their horsemen come galloping. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swooping down to devour. All of them come for violence. Their horde of faces moves forward. They collect captives like sand. They mock at kings and rulers are a laughing matter to them. They laugh at every fortress and heap up rubble to capture it. Then they will sweep through like the wind and pass on, but they will be held guilty. They whose strength is their God. Habakkuk says, God, where are you? God, what are you doing? You see what God does? God says, okay, okay, Habakkuk. Here's my answer. I'm going to use the Chaldeans. Habakkuk goes, you're what? How in the world are you going to use the Chaldeans who are more wicked than the, the nation of Judah? Habakkuk doesn't like it. God answers and he says, I'm going to use the Chaldeans to punish Judah. He describes the Chaldeans. They are fierce and impetuous. They seize dwelling places. They are dreaded and feared. People don't like them. Justice and authority originate within themselves. They come for violence. They, co they collect captives. They mock authority. They mock kings, the rulers. They're a laughing matter. Their strength is their God. See, Habakkuk says, God, where are you? And, and maybe we, we are all sinners and, and we struggle. And it's hard. Unless I'm alone. This is hard. But God is on his throne. 
And God says, I'm going to protect my church. I'm going, to, I'm going to watch over my church. And we as a church are going to be a city on a hill that proclaims Christ. Habakkuk says, God, where are you? And, and God says, I'm going to send the Chaldeans. Guess what Habakkuk thought of that? Yeah, that's weird. That's not right. Chapter 1, verse 12. Are you not, remember, lasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One, we will not die. You, O Lord, have appointed them to judge. And you, O Rock, have established them to correct. Your eyes are too pure to approve evil. And you cannot look on wickedness with favor. Why do you look with favor on those who deal treacherously? The back, he says, God, I got another question. Why are you doing it that way? I don't think that's right. Maybe we look at what's happened in our world and go, God, I, I don't think that's right. <laughs> From my feeble perspective, y'all, things have got to get worse if you want Christ to come back. That's biblical, isn't it? Things have got to get worse. So bring it on, right? <laughs> Let us stand up for Christ. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I mean, that's how I understand my Bible. Habakkuk, you know, 12 all the way to the end of the chapter, he is questioning the, the reason why God would use the Chaldeans. But, but look at chapter 2. We're not going to read the whole thing, I promise. But in, but in chapter 2, verse 4, God answers the prophet. <clears throat> Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. The righteous will live by faith. How is this played out on a day-to-day -day basis in your life? How is this played out on a day-to-day -day basis in my life? God is going to take care of the Chaldeans. We see that if we were to read through 5 through 20, But in, in 2 5, he says, Furthermore, wine betrays the haughty man so that he does not stay at home. He enlarges his appetite like Sheol, and he is like death, never satisfied. He also gathers to himself all nations and collects to himself all peoples. So as, as God is answering Habakkuk, he's basically saying, Habakkuk, I've got it in control. This is my plan being orchestrated. Habakkuk says, God, I'm struggling. I don't understand what you're going to deal with the sin of Judah. He says, I'm going to allow the Chaldeans. And Habakkuk goes, you're what? Well, why them? And God says, Habakkuk, the righteous live by faith. How does Habakkuk respond? Chapter 3. says a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet verse 2 says Lord I've heard the report about you and I fear O Lord revive your works in the midst of the years in the midst of the years make it known in wrath remember mercy God comes from Taman and the Holy One from Mount Haran, Selah. His splendor covers the heavens and the earth is full of his praise. His radiance is like the sunlight. He has rays flashing from his hand. And there is the hiding of his power. (Laughter) 
Jump down to verse 18. They've had this big, long dialogue going on, and we're not going through it all. But Habakkuk says, God, why? God says, I'm going to punish the sin. Habakkuk says, why them? God says, the righteous will live by faith. And then Habakkuk's response in verse 18, here, here's what the end result is. Yet I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. And he has made me, he has made my feet like hinds feet and makes me walk on my high places. For the choir director on my string instruments. Habakkuk stops and he says, okay, God, I'll exalt you and I will trust you. Folks, as I told you, my heart is so heavy for every believer, for our church, for the believers at large, for the universal church, the things I read, the things I hear, the phone calls I get, everything that is going on is crazy. I pray and I, I talk to the Lord and I say, God, this is more than I bargained for. But you don't put more on us than we were able to bear. So let me draw several applications as we are not obviously going to go as long this morning. But let me draw your attention to several passages. Things are difficult. There's been this executive order to wear a mask. There's lots of negotiation or explanation on what that means. I have had countless phone calls. I've had countless meetings. And my answer is God is still on his throne. I will encourage people to obey where they can. And when they overstep their bounds and they say that we can't worship and we can't sing, then I'm going to have a problem. But what do we do? Habakkuk questions God. His end result was I'm going to exalt in God. Several things. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. I love what he says to us. He says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Brothers and sisters, may I encourage you, when you begin to get frustrated or upset or angry or whatever it is, call sin, sin. Don't excuse your sin because you don't like something. Okay? Sin is sin. And when we begin to get into that situation where I'm angry, then we need to confess it and we need to put our eyes back on Jesus, not on ourselves and our circumstances. Turn to Colossians. And I'm sorry for those who expected me to be in Colossians. I just, the Lord laid this on my heart and we will be in Colossians soon next week. John is going to preach because I will not get back till late Thursday night. And the elders said, Jake, let one of us preach. Don't try to study Friday and Saturday and come in again. So he's going to do that. And then after that, we'll be back in our study in Colossians. I can never. This verse always comes to mind. Colossians chapter one, verse We'll start in verse 15, sorry. 
He, Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. Here it is. Circle it, highlight it, write it, write it on your forehead, whatever you need to do. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Even when it seems like everything is falling apart and it's crazy, this is a fact. We believe the Word of God. We teach the Word of God in a literal, grammatical, historical methodology. That is our hermeneutic. When it says that he holds all things together, that's exactly what it means. When we don't think from our perspective that he's got it, he does got it. He does have it. Rest in that. You all know this, 2 Timothy 2.15. Let me encourage you. And there's a time and there's a place to weigh out and discuss. Well, what do you think about the executive order? What should we do? How should we do it? Where should we do it? Yeah, I get it. I spent hours involved in it. But let me encourage you, as you may be nervous and uncomfortable and thinking that America is going to come after us and, and shut the church down, praise God, bring it on. Because I'm not going to back down from who my God is. I pray that you don't either. But the amount of time that we spend discussing, debating, arguing, whatever it is, take that time and do this, 2 Timothy 2.15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman accurately handling the word of God. Talk about the word of God with brothers and sisters in Christ. There's a time and a place to work through these things, but the time and the hours and all that I see happening, it's unbelievable. If I could sleep as much as I hear the discussion about this executive order, y'all, I'd be set for five years, I think. It's crazy. Let me encourage you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Our, as we are struggling and saying, what do we do? How do we respond? God, what do you want from us? We are to exalt God and live for God, regardless of what happens. So fix your eyes on Jesus. Take comfort in all things hold together. Be committed to studying the Word of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We could have played sword drills. I'm sorry. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We are brothers and sisters in Christ for those who know him as their Lord and their Savior. He says in verse 14, writing to the church at Thessalonica, verse 14, he says, We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always. When you're wearing a face mask, when you're not wearing a face mask, rejoice. I don't know about you, but when I'm wearing a face mask, it might be hard to hear somebody, so I walk around singing songs. I can't sing, but I'm being biblical, so I'm 100, making joyful noise to the Lord, right? Right. Just talk louder. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is what we are to be doing, folks. This is what we are to do as brothers and sisters. <coughs> in everything give thanks. Pray without ceasing. I can't get it out of my mind. I hear people say, not to hear, outside, there's no way someone can be saved. I was like, look, they saved me. Anybody can be saved. Come on. 
Let's go be crazy for Christ. Let me encourage you. Turn to 1 Corinthians. I said we were going to be done early. <laughs> Lord, forgive me if I lied. I started off when I asked the question, how are you going to respond? Or how are you going to respond when you're tempted to question God? God, why? Why? Why is this happening? What are we doing? Why is this? Why is that? Live for God. Live for God. But I pray for us. This is my prayer for our church. Therefore, verse 58, therefore, my beloved brethren and sisters, be steadfast immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in the vain, or is not in vain in the Lord. I want you to focus on always abounding in the work of the Lord. Keep growing. Keep loving God. Keep loving your neighbor. Don't stop We're getting close. Go to Philippians. Philippians, I want us to start <coughs> chapter 2. If you do not get anything else out of what I have said, what I've tried to encourage you this morning, get this. Don't miss it, please. Philippians, Paul is writing from prison. He writes and he says, this is what your life in Christ would look like. Folks, this is where the rubber meets the road. We're in a difficult time. How are we as Christians going to respond? Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love. Circle this, underlined, highlighted. United in spirit, intent on one purpose. Folks, pray for your brothers and sisters. Pray for our church. Pray for our elders. Pray for our deacons that we will be united. Two more. Hold your hand in Philippians. We're coming back. Just listen to this. In 1 Timothy chapter... No, 1 Peter... Timothy and Peter are not even close. Listen to this. I want to read several verses. Chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and they partake also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. Folks, that's the desire of your elder board. That's what we strive to do. Verse 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men likewise be subject to your elders and all of you clothe yourself with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, 
As a result of all of what he's just said, we have to ask, what is the therefore, therefore? Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Here it is. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Satan is at work to cause division in the body of Christ. We must come together. I'm not saying everybody agree with what Jake says. I'm not saying that. Let's agree with what the Bible says and work together to be united in all that we do. Okay, Philippians 4. And I'm done. Hold me to that. I gotta stop the sweat from dripping on my glasses. I can't see. Sorry. Philippians chapter 4, listen. Therefore, my beloved brother, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge Iodia and I urge Sintiki to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. We are in a spiritual battle. The devil is on a mission to destroy believers. He's on a mission to destroy his church. And what Paul writes in Philippians 4, he says, stand firm in the race, right? Verse 1, he says, stand firm. And then when he talks about those two lovely ladies, Candace, we adopt kids. I like the name. <clears throat> Just kidding. Yodi and Sintiki, there was some disunity. There was something that they could not get along over. And Paul says, Clement, help them. It wasn't an adoptional issue. Maybe a matter of personal preference. I don't like having donuts in Sunday school, or I do, or I like decaf coffee or real coffee, or I like vanilla cream, or I like... Okay. He says, Clement, help them get over it. Live in harmony. And then he, he, as he says, as you are in this race, stand firm. Be on guard and, and live harmoniously with one another. Act harmoniously. Get along as the body of Christ. And he says, rejoice in the Lord. He says, let your gentleness be known. Let your contentment be known in your life. And then he talks about, we can't go through it all, but he says, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. So go to the Lord, pray. Let him know your heart. Be honest. God, I'm struggling. God, I'm discouraged. And then he says in verses 8 and 9, he says, think biblically. Be biblical in what you do. Folks, we have the opportunity more than ever because we are in a challenging time. But stand up and let Christ be demonstrated in your conduct. Be on guard. We know the verses. We know what the Bible says. Now we get the chance to live them out. And I ask you, I pray for you. I ask you, and I know you do, and I appreciate it, but pray for us. Pray for our church. Pray for our family. This is hard. But we will not, as a church, back down from the gospel of Jesus Christ. We will stand no matter the cost. 
but we will obey i will encourage to obey where we can obey so pray for your church leadership we pray for you and if you have questions call me let me just ask out of love for each of you i know everybody has their opinions on this executive order i know i've heard it deal with it quickly get it out of the way and talk about what God's accomplishing in your life. Pray that we'd be faithful to grow in our walk with Christ. Of course, if you're here and you don't know Christ as your Lord and your Savior, understand that the wages of sin is death. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is desperately wicked. No one can understand. Because of our sin, we deserve to die and go to a place called hell. Hell is a reality. Daniel 12 and following teaches that. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus lived a perfect life on this earth. So many people say, no, there's no way he could have lived a perfect life. I said, then he couldn't die for your sins on the cross. It was a worthless death. And understand that he did live a perfect life. He lived a perfect life because he was God, the hypostatic union, 100% God and 100% man. He lived a perfect life and he went and he died on that cross. And it was as my sin was laid on his hand and your sin and all the sin of the world. And it was beaten into his body. And then the same happened on his feet. It was as if our sin was laid there and it was beaten into the perfect body of Christ. God treats Jesus as if he had lived my life. And he treats me as if I had lived Jesus' perfect life. What? An amazing God. Mm -hmm. Blows my mind. The Bible says, confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. No question. Friends, let me encourage you if you know Christ. Now, if you struggle with sharing the gospel, stand up and share Christ. We had those wonderful gentlemen cutting our trees down. Did you guys see them? The power lines, cutting back the power lines this past week. I approached them, and I actually I hollered at them through my screen window, scared them. It was hilarious. <laughs> and I said, hey, what time's your lunch? I'm buying you lunch. And they were like, huh? They couldn't meet. And so I said that for this past week on Tuesday. And he called the church office and he left a message. And Kathy goes, I, I don't know who this guy is. He doesn't know who he's meeting with, but he called and said he can't make it. I said, I know who he is. And she's like, what's his name? I said, I have no idea. So I got the phone number. I called him and he realized who I was. And in the providence of God, his grandma had a massive heart attack and died. What an opportunity for the gospel. What an opportunity. So I went down the other day, down to the park, fell over laying on the ground to get down low enough to eat lunch with them, and we talked about the gospel. He lives in Grand Junction. The other guy lives in Montrose. They're like, Jake, can we come to church? I said, you want to drive that far? You can sleep in my house if you want. Your families, whatever. But people are asking about the gospel. People are scared. People are nervous. And so I pray for those who know Christ to take advantage of every opportunity because we don't know when our Lord is coming back, but we want to be ready and we want to be found ready when he does come back. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are a good and a great and an awesome God. Father, you know my heart. You know I'm nervous. But I know that our God is on his throne. He holds the world in the palm of his hands. And Father, as a church, as believers, I pray that we would be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Help us to be faithful to you. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters, our family who is here. God, I pray that you would help us to be a church that is unified. God, be with the universal churches as believers are struggling and they don't know what to do and, and if they feel our rights are being taken over or this or that, God, I pray that you would protect your church. I pray that you protect us. 
Help us to be faithful to your word, not only in word, but, Father, in our lifestyle. Father, as we see and we quickly look at Habakkuk and how he asked the question, in the end result, Habakkuk said, okay, God, I will exalt you. I pray, God, that we as a church, as believers, as we maybe struggle with what's happening and what's being asked of us, Lord God, I pray that our end response would be, I will exalt my God, our God. Our creator, our maker, our master, our alpha, our omega, the beginning and end, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Father, I pray that you would protect this church. And Father, if there's one here who's never placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I beg you to break them of their sin. Break them of their pride. Help them to understand that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Father, I beg you to use the feeble things that were said this morning to accomplish your will for your glory and for your praise. It's in your son's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.